This is a Reconstruction Radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com slash freebooks for a PDF download of this book and for many other great Christian books. Backward Christian Soldiers, an Action Manual for Christian Reconstruction by Gary North, copyright 1984, published by Institute for Christian Economics, narrated by Alan Bailey. Chapter 3, Eschatologies of Shipwreck. The state needs pastors who preach a theology of defeat. It keeps the layman quiet in an era in which Christian laymen are the most significant potential threat to the unwarranted expansion of state power. The great chapter in the New Testament which deals with the division of labor within the church is 1 Corinthians 12. The basic teaching is found in verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. The church, the body of Christ, is to perform as a disciplined, integrated body performs. It is not to fight against itself, trip itself, or be marked by jealousy, one member against another. The 20th century has brought with it a deplorable application of these words. Instead of viewing the body of Christ as a symbolic body, uh, with Christ as the head, modern Christians have adopted the Roman Catholic practice of regarding the priesthood as the head, heart, and hands, with laymen serving as the back, feet, and legs. In other words, the priests serve as the unquestioned specialist in religion, while laymen, including elders, serve as the secular hewers of wood and drawers of water. The laymen are specialists in the things of the world, while their priests take care of the spiritual realm. We call this outlay, outlook sacerdotalism. This unfortunate development began very early in the history of Protestantism, though its full implications have taken several centuries to work out in practice. Protestant sacerdotalism, like Protestant scholasticism, has been with us for a long time. Laymen have automatically assumed that the division of labor spoken of in the New Testament is a division of labor between secular and spiritual pursuits. But this is not what the New Testament teaches at all. The New Testament's vision of Christ's comprehensive kingdom involves the whole world. Jesus announced, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Modern Christians really cannot seem to accept Christ's words. They reinterpret them to say, All power is given to me in heaven... But I have abdicated abdicated as far as the earth is concerned. The priest, as representatives of Christ's spiritual power, which is supposedly the only real power that Christ systematically exercises, are understood to be the central figures in the kingdom. Laymen, who supposedly specialize in earthly affairs, are bearers of an inferior authority, not merely subordinate authority, but by nature inferior. One of the reasons why Christians have adopted the peculiar view of authority outlined above has to do with the concept of victory. From Augustine to Kuiper, or from Luther to Bart, expositors have too often limited the promise of victory to the institutional church itself are even more radically to the human heart alone. Where a man's heart is, there will be his kingdom. If his hope of victory is limited to his own heart, then his concern will be drastically narrowed. He will worry about his own heart, his personal standing before God, his own sanctification, and his relationship with the institutional church he will be far less concerned about exercising disciplined authority in the so-called secular realm. It is difficult psychologically to wage war on a battlefield, which by definition belongs to the enemy. An army which lacks confidence is defeated before it takes the field. 
This is why God commanded Gideon to announce to the Israelites, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. Judges 7 verse 3. A Theology of Shipwreck What we have seen, especially since the First World War, is a retreat from victory by Christians. Precisely at the time when humanism's hopes of a perfectible earth were shattered on the battlefields of Europe, the Christians also gave up any hope. The Christians had seen the technological victories of secularism and they had mentally equated these victories with Christ's kingdom promises. When the secular ship went down in a sea of needlessly shed blood, the Christians grabbed the only life preservers they thought were available, pessimistic eschatologies. They took comfort from the fact that the ship had sunk, not because they were safely sailing on a rival ship, but because all optimistic endeavors are supposedly doomed. They had built no ship of their own to compete with the Titanic of secularism, so they comforted themselves by clinging to theologies of universal sunken ships. There are those who parade a theology of ship designing. They say that we ought to conquer the earth by means of Christian institutions. They claim that they have have designs ready and waiting, cosmonomic designs certified to export by the Dutch Board of Trade, but but that they know in advance that there is no market for such designs, no capital to begin construction, and no hope of seeing them completed. They feel that they have been faithful to the Bible by merely proclaiming the hypothetical possibility of the external kingdom of God on earth. They have not bothered to get down to the blueprint stage simply because they have not believed that their social and economic designs could ever be implemented. All ships ultimately are doomed, say these theologians of shipwreck. Is it surprising then that the dominies of clerical robes are considered to be immune to criticism by laymen within ecclesiastical organizations that are based on a theology of shipwreck. After all, if all secular ships must go down eventually, and all Christian social institutions are equally doomed, then the only hope is the life jacket of internal victory. Spiritual victory is all that counts since this alone will float in a sea of social chaos. And we must always remember it is only ordained pastors who pass out the life jackets. They have the keys to the kingdom, meaning the sacraments, preaching, and institutional discipline within the churches. This is the only kingdom there is, if not theoretically, then at least practically. The kingdom is finally equated with the institutional church and its operations, despite the fact that Protestant theologians officially reject this medieval vision of the kingdom. Where there is no victory possible, there we find no theology of dominion. Eschatology and tyranny. If men have no hope of being able to reform the external world, the world outside the institutional churches, then they are faced with two sources of tyranny. The first is ecclesiastical, the second is political. Ecclesiastical tyranny stems from the monopoly position which pastors are understood to enjoy within the confines of the institutional churches. If the internal kingdom is the only hiding place for weary, beaten laymen, inevitably defeated in a world devoid of Christ's power, then laymen must accept this resting place on the terms assigned to them by the ordained leadership. A monopoly can extract monopoly returns after all. The only competition faced by the clerics, given an eschatology of external defeat, is that offered by other clerics in other churches. 
The world offers no comforts, no hope of successes enjoyed by faithful Christians, no promise of dominion in terms of biblical revelation. The only hope of victory is the victory of the life jacket. Of course, other churches can offer life jackets. This reduces the power of the defenders of Protestant sacerdotalism, but it does not eliminate it. Laymen, in relation to their ecclesiastical superiors, can only play off one another against another. They cannot exercise comparable authority in any significant sphere of life officially belonging to them because their spheres of legitimate authority are battlefields of guaranteed defeat. At best, laymen can be generals of ragtag armies of incompetence. An eschatology of shipwreck also leaves men virtually helpless against the unwarranted demands of an expanding civil government. Humanism may be bankrupt, but Christians, who own moral and cultural capital because of their relationship with Christ, are unwilling to make a run on the banks of humanism. Therefore, the state expands its naked power since few voices are raised in principle protest. The Christians remain silent, or at least confused in their opposition, precisely because they have been taught that impotence politically and culturally is their assigned task on earth. There are two realms, spiritual and secular, and the secular realm is one of chaos and defeat. Why spend time in principle protest if the only possible result is defeat? How much capital, energy, time, money, commitment will men invest in a venture which has attacked, attached to it the theological equivalent of a bad housekeeping seal of approval? Conclusion So what we find in the 20th century is a twofold expansion of power, first by the defenders of Protestant sacerdotalism, and second, by the secular state. The state needs pastors who preach a theology of defeat. It keeps the layman quiet in an era in which Christian laymen are the most significant potential threat to the unwarranted expansion of state power. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.